How can the skills of a cold case detective help you better investigate the claims of the Bible? Find out on today's episode of A View from the Wall. Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. This is Dylan Burroughs here with co-host Joseph Kerr. And scripture teaches us to always be prepared to give the reason for the hope within us, yet many of us lack the information needed to confidently share our faith. Today we are joined by Detective J. Warner Wallace, who became a follower of Christ after applying his investigative skills to the New Testament. His investigations have been featured on NBC's Dateline, and his work has appeared on Court TV and Fox News. He is the author of numerous best-selling books, including his most popular work, Cold Case Christianity. Jay Warner Wallace, welcome to A View from the Wall. No, I'm so glad to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us again here today, Jim. And we want to begin with your story because it's so powerful. You were in your 30s serving as a detective, yet something happened as you began to research your own faith. Tell us about your journey to Christ. Yeah, I, ne- I never would have thought of it that way as my own faith, right? I just didn't think that was something that was really necessary. I didn't know anybody growing up who, you know, uh, it was open about their faith or what they believed about God. The few that I did know, um, you know, we had a couple of guys on our, our department, but for the most part, we had kind of put them in a box, you know, um, mm-hmm. as a group. <laughs> and then a lot of the people we were taking to jail would tell us that they were uh, Christians. And so they just to, for us, for those of us who were outspoken about how silly this was, it just gave us more fuel to complain about, right? So, and so most of the people I knew I was closest to at the time, we would mock a lot of the people who take to jail who would tell us, you know, they're supposed to be the bad guys, right? Mm-hmm. And, and they're, yeah, they're the ones who are claiming that they are, you know, church going Christians. And that, that kind of was where I stood for a lot of years, um, kind of sarcastically looking out from the outside, looking in. Um, but my wife was more interested in, you know, exploring this than, than I was, although I, we were probably in the same position. We, we didn't have a Bible in the house. We really had no idea what the Bible taught about pretty much anything. And, but we were, you know, she said, let's, let's go to church because let's decide if we're going to raise our kids to, to at least have an option. And, um, I was more than willing to go as an atheist because my, you know, my dad for his entire life has gone to church as an atheist. And, uh, if, if he, he's married to second marriage and, if he, she wants to go to church, he's happy to go, although he doesn't believe any of it's true. And so that was really the way that I considered it as well. I just thought, okay, I'll go. Um, and But I found myself, um, this pastor in this particular church I went to would talk about Jesus as though he was uh, really smart um, and influential and maybe smart in a way that's like nobody else has ever been that smart, kind of smart. <laughs> so I thought, is that true? Of course, this stuff is encased in the Gospels, and those Gospels you know, are, are claims about a, a period of time involving what they claim are real people and real events that occurred in a certain sequence. And that's really what got me interested, you know, because I trust these as eyewitness um, accounts of something that really happened in the past, and that was the kind of thing I had a skill that I could apply. And that's really how I started studying the, the New Testament, really, as whether or not they were reliable eyewitness accounts. I can see how that would interest a detective, because apologetics is really the study of understanding how we get to the conclusions we have as Christians. Now, we have some listeners who understand the word apologetics, but some people think of that and they're like, apologetics? Uh, Yeah, why do I need to know anything about that? I'm not writing theology books or going to seminary. How would the average Christian use this kind of investigative techniques and understanding of apologetics in their regular Christian walk. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think um, I, I never liked that word. I didn't really understand it. I didn't, I didn't see myself as somebody who was investigating apologetics or working through apologetics. I, although, you know, what I was doing would definitely fit in that uh, overarching kind of category. But I, as a guy who didn't really have any, I was not raised in the church, had no idea what if you said theology, what that was even going to entail. Um, that's just not where I was coming from. I just simply thought, well, doesn't everyone, when presented with a claim about the past, take the time to investigate the claim this way? I mean, I thought that everyone did this. And so for me, it's really about, and I, by the way, I just don't think that you can do this. I mean, whatever our approach to evangelizing was a generation ago, prior to um, smartphones, 
prior to a generation that's been raised visually, prior to a generation that encounters the skeptics now the minute they get the phone, um, because the internet is, is, is actually inclined toward the skeptical position rather than toward the Christian position, um, I don't know how in the world you can make a case for this or even talk about it to a generation that is being told that everything else is supported by the evidence. And so, well, it turns out Christianity is supported by the evidence. So, so we ought to be able to speak the same language that the culture is speaking about lies when we're trying to convince the next generation about the truth. So I, I don't think we really are going to have options anymore. You're going to say, you could, you could definitely say I had this experience that convinced me it was true, but everyone now has got some kind of experience and they're more inclined to think that way than ever before. You know, what's good for you is good for you. You live your life, all of you be you, I'll be me. Well, it turns out that the Christianity is, is, is offering something that is overarching. It's not just about whether you like it or whether it fits you or whether it, you, you know, it, it, it's for you. It's, it's that it's, it's true whether it, you like it or not. <laughs> but there are lots of things that are true. Really, you're, you're going to get vaccinated probably at some point for this, this, this virus, or you're going to take a, a shot of penicillin to cure a, that. It turns out that penicillin is not a matter of opinion. That's an overarching drug that is true to cure that infection for everyone, and you just happen to be in that group. Well, this is the kind of claims that, that, that Christianity makes, it, that, that this is a true cure for what's killing all of us spiritually, even if you don't like it. Well, that's a good area to investigate more. We want to talk about that because one of the concerns of today's churches is the low lack of biblical literacy. It's been said in our upcoming generation, Generation Z, that only about 2% hold a biblical worldview and other generations aren't much better. How can we better know our own faith and help equip others in understanding their faith as well? Yeah, I do think that's going to be the, the, one of the real battlegrounds, right? When we do this, this, um, this, this enterprise of making a case for what is true, you really have two target audiences in mind, right? One is maybe you've got friends and family members who don't believe in Christianity, and so you're trying to reach people who hold up to you other than Christianity, that Christianity is true. But it turns out that there's still a huge group of people who would identify as Christians but have no idea what it means to identify as Christians. And that's right. a group that we're going to have to reach with the evidence and with good reasoning, right? So I, my, my work is pretty focused on two things. Is the Bible true? And should we take it seriously? I think that's actually upstream from a lot of other problems we have in the culture. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, Bible, if you don't think the Bible is true, we're not going to agree down downfield on any kind of issue, right? Because if you think that the what I'm basing my worldview on is false, well, then, of course, we're not going to agree. But even if we did agree that the Bible is true, if you don't take it seriously enough to actually read it, to actually to develop your thinking by taking the broadest possible uh, spectrum of claims from Scripture rather than cherry-pick out your verse and make it work for what you want it to work for. If you're not taking it seriously from what we call biblical hermeneutics, you know, how do I read the Bible? Well, then it turns out we might still end up in two different places, even though we both call ourselves Christian. So I think that, that, that work for us is to do those two things. Is the Bible true? That's going to be for a lot of people who are outside the family of Christians. But should we take it seriously as for the stuff that, you know, is inside the family of Christians? Well, that's a great point, and we want to talk more about this, but we have to take a quick break, so stay with us. We'll be right back with more here on A View from the Wall. From I Am a Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am a Watchman Minute. The story of King Hezekiah is a story that reveals the grace of God. There was a time when Hezekiah was blessed with a great victory over an enemy. But when the people praised Hezekiah for the victory, he did not direct them to give glory to God, and God was not pleased. So God sent a prophet to tell the king that because of this sin, his reign and his life were over. Hezekiah was told to put his affairs in order for tomorrow he was going to die. What would you do? He was guilty. God had declared judgment. Well, Hezekiah prayed, he cried out for forgiveness, and it was granted. God forgave the king and restored the king. And from this story, we learn that it is never too late to ask for forgiveness and turn to God, and that God's grace is always greater than our sin. Be bold, be faithful, be a watchman. I am a watchman.com. Welcome back to A View from the Wall, as Joe and I talk with Jim Warner Wallace, author of Cold Case Christianity and many other best-selling books, we want to discuss how Bible prophecy helps support our Christian faith. 
So in defending our Christian worldview, Jim, one important area is Bible prophecy. What are some of the cold case techniques we can use to determine the role of Bible prophecy in our faith today? Okay, well, let me just talk about what you see at crime scenes. There's two kinds of evidence at crime scenes. Uh, some evidence is, is very, very clear because it, is, uh, it, it points to the suspect before you ever meet him. So a fingerprint, if there's a fingerprint database, can identify a suspect at a crime scene. DNA, if there's a DNA database, it can identify somebody before you ever meet them. This thing in the crime scene points clearly to a specific suspect who's outside the crime scene. But there's other evidence in the crime scene that's not clear. It's what I call cloaked evidence. So, for example, I might find a button at the crime scene. Now, I can't find that button matching anything on the victim. So maybe that button came off the suspect's shirt. But I won't know that until after I meet the suspect and I examine his shirt and I find out, sure, it's got a missing button. So it turns out some evidence in the crime scene is not going to point of immediately and identify my, my suspect in advance, but after I have identified the suspect, it's going to confirm that identification. Does that make sense? So there's two kinds of evidence at crime scenes, clear and cloaked. Now, I see that in Scripture, in the Old Testament prophecies, there are two kinds of prophecies pointing to the Messiah. They fall in the same categories, clear and cloaked. Some of that prophecy is going to, point, is going to be specifically talking about the Messiah who is to come, and describing him in such a way that you should be able to identify him. Others are going to be more cloaked, that once you have identified the Messiah, you'll go back and say, oh yeah, that button belongs to his shirt. So, so what I see people making a mistake is arguing that all of those prophecies are in the same category. So as an atheist, when I come along, I see some prophecy, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm reading this out of the Psalms. This is not even speaking about a Messiah. This is speaking about David. Okay, well, this, that's, that's in a different category. I, I, it, it, it was presented to me as though it's clear, but really, it's, it's still a valid prophecy. As a matter of fact, the New Testament authors will tell you that, yeah, this is like that button that, that confirms that Jesus is the Messiah. But I, I can't look at it in, in advance and say, I would, and as a matter of fact, the original readers of this would probably, according to the Jewish scholars, they're saying, hey, we never even identified that particular piece. Only you Christians identify that particular piece as messianic to begin with. But what we're doing is we're saying, no, no, no. So here's what I did. I have a new book coming out in September called Person of Interest, and I just looked at these prophecies. And I'll tell you that, that, that if you just stripped out all the ones that are cloaked and say, okay, here's a for sake of argument alone, I'm not even going to consider those. Mm -hmm. And then you only used reliable, I, uh, reliable prophets. I call those the people who have actually predicted something that occurred in history, and they got that right. So why wouldn't you listen to what they say about the Messiah? So that's folks like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and other folks like this who have actually made accurate predictions about history. And if all you did was just focus on their clear prophecies, it still points to Jesus. <laughs> so if you stripped out all the stuff that people like me as an atheist would have argued about and said, I'm not even sure you can count that as a prophecy, it's cloaked. Can you strip that out? That you're still going to be pointing to the same person, Jesus of Nazareth, is clear from the minimalistic, clear prophecies of just those few prophets who also predicted things about history. You're stuck with Jesus either way. That is such a great way to look at it and a great way for us to use that as a tool to witness. I love that you put it in those terms, and I'm glad that you brought it to our attention from a detective's perspective, because I can follow that. That makes sense to me. And even if I wasn't a Christian, that would make sense to me. So let's bring it into the New Testament then and talk about the prophet Jesus. As he prophesied in Matthew 24, and it's recorded also in Luke and Mark, he predicted wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilence, all those kind of things. And Obviously, we're seeing many of those things in what we identify, what Paul identified as the last days. Yeah. So taking Jesus' prophecies from 2,000 years ago, how well would his prophecies, from a detective's viewpoint, how would they hold up in court? Okay, I, I think that, what, I, I, first of all, if Jesus, the first question would be, well, why would we think that Jesus could accurately prophesy anything? Well, he did prophesy some things that, that um, came true within the period we can examine, like the, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, there are people who will argue, well, yeah, that's not a real prophecy, because they think, because it actually was fulfilled, that that must have been written after 70 AD, when the author would have known that the, prophet, that the uh, temple was destroyed. So now he puts it coming out of the mouth of Jesus, as if Jesus prophesied it. But no, the reality of it is, that there's good reasons, and I talk about these in cold case Christianity, to date the Gospels much earlier than that. That's an accurate prediction. But, but more importantly, if we think that the resurrection occurred based on the evidence, 
then Jesus is in a completely different category. I always say that I, I have a tendency to believe people who rise from the dead, okay? They're in a different category. You might say, I can prophesy, predict something. But if you demonstrated your deity by rising from the grave, I'm probably more likely going to give you a little more credit. Oh, so there yes. are some reasons why we ought to listen if we do believe that the evidence is strong for the resurrection. We ought to listen to what Jesus predicts. Now, interestingly, predictions about end times are just vague enough to keep us on our toes, but not give us the kind of predictive power that, for example, allows us to invest in the stock market, right? Because we know that the end time signs are right there, so we're going to make a ton of money. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I'm always hesitant to say that we're in that period because if I've, read, I've, read, I've read the scholars, the, the Christian scholars, who were writing before World War I and before World War II and during the Depression. And, I mean, we've always been predicting. If you listen to one of my favorite uh, guys on the radio is Jay Vernon McGee. I don't know if you know who that is, but he was a pastor out here in Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Well, if you listen to his sermons from the 60s and 70s, you swear he's, talk, he's, like, we're like, he's talking right now. Because it, it seems like we're always in those periods, or there are several times in history— when people, I'm sure during the pandemic of 1918, there were lots of folks who thought Jesus is going to be here any minute. But so I always I was hesitant to kind of like target in and and because it's just vague enough to do what it is I think Jesus wants us to do with prophecies, which is to be watchful and to be ready, but not necessarily to be entirely predictive. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, that's a good way to put it. And we want to talk more about this with Jim Warner Wallace, author of Cold Case Christianity and many other best-selling books, coldcasechristianity.com. And we'll talk more about that after the break. Stick with us for more on A View from the Wall. The rapture can happen at any time. You may be ready, but are your friends and family spiritually prepared for the coming of the Lord? What will happen to those left behind? We've created a new resource to help you help them. It's called the Rapture Kit. Included in the Rapture Kit is a Bible and vital information on what the Rapture is and how to prepare for what's to come. The Rapture Kit also includes eight books on prophecy, apologetics, the Christian walk, and being a watchman for the Lord, plus a number of video and audio teachings all preloaded on an eight gigabyte flash drive. Become more strategic and active in your witnessing. Warn the lost about the coming rapture and help individuals in the post-rapture world be drawn to Christ, equipping them to become the next generation of ministry leaders. Learn more and order at rapturekit.org. Welcome back to A View from the Wall as we continue our discussion with Jim Warner Wallace, the detective and author of Cold Case Christianity. We want to briefly mention that his book, Cold Case Christianity, is available at IamAWatchman.com along with some of his other resources. You can also go to ColdCaseChristianity.com and see many of the free resources he has right now. And as we continue our discussion as believers, we want to know the information that supports our faith. And we've talked about some of those resources that he offers, but we also need to know how to share it with compassion. It's this idea of sharing the truth and love that the Apostle Paul talked about. So take a little time to explain how we can do this better. How can we share the truth in a way that's winsome and compelling to those who have yet to believe? Yeah, I think sometimes it's a difference between being argumentative and making an argument, right? So I think the difference really is, is that what is the focus of your endeavor, the enterprise? If the focus of the enterprise is the argument, is the claim, is the objection, or is the focus of your enterprise the person offering the argument or the claim or the objection? As long as we are focused on answering the person rather than answering the objection, you're going to be fine. Because I, I can tell when I could probably win this argument, I could bombard them with all this stuff I might know or I see they made a mistake and they're arguing. And so I could you know, kind of spank that down and win the argument. But – that's not going to help me. I can tell when I'm looking at the eyes of the person I'm talking to if I still have them, if, I, if they're still with me, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in the end, my bigger concern in a generation that really is watching us do this, because uh, here's the problem is that there's so many counterclaims out there. Like I've never done a jury trial where I made my, my, the claims on the prosecution side and had the defense team come up and say, that was so darn good, I have nothing to say. <laughs> we just rest. No, they're going to spend weeks making the counter-argument, even when their guy's going to confess to it later on anyway. 
that doesn't, you know, they still make a counter argument. So it's not as though I can get involved in that where I'm, I make a claim and you make a claim. I make a counter claim. You make the counter counter claim. I make the counter 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 claim. We can do this all day. So a lot of it is I just need to know what is driving. So maybe the best, first best question is you're offering this objection, but there's something deeper at the core that's bugging you about Christianity. Let's get to that first. That this, how is this impacting you? Why do you care? You ever wonder why people get online and make such uh, vociferous um, objections to Christianity? It's like, okay, so uh, there's something driving this. You must have had some – you have a feeling now. You, you believe now that in some way Christianity is actually evil or dangerous. What got you to that point? I want to know that kind of stuff. So a lot of this is just about changing our focus from the argument and the objection to the person who's making the argument and the objection. That is such a good way to put it, because we can, in some cases, bombard people with all the facts and, and in fact, win the argument, but lose the person. And there's no point in doing that. We we are right. called to win people to Christ, not to win arguments. And sometimes right. you have to answer an objection and and discuss the particular problem in order to reach their art, just like you studied all of the things you did from a cold case perspective to come to the conclusion that Christ was real and that he needed to be part of your world. So sometimes we have to manage those arguments, but we have to remember at the same time, it's about winning the person, not winning the fight. Yeah. And remember that, you know, for a lot of us, we were that person and, or, you know, somebody you love, your kids, uh, somebody in your family, your spouse, who is still that person. So I'm, I'm always thinking to myself, hey, if I was talking to me, what would turn me off right away? What would shut this conversation down? And I'm trying, to, I'm trying not to be that guy. Well, that's a good way to put it. And one thing we always like to discuss with our guests in each broadcast is to make sure we offer time to challenge and encourage those who listen to our broadcast. They call themselves watchmen or watchwomen. They see Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. For those who are looking for ways to better watch, warn, and witness in these days, what are some things you can do to encourage people along the lines of what we've been talking about today? Well, a couple of things. I think we, uh, I, my focus, and I write books that I hope are accessible to adults, but I'm really thinking about the next generation coming up. Um, yes. Because we, you know, and, and, and if we're going to spend time either stopping hemorrhaging from the church, um, you, know, you know, people who are leaving, or we're going to spend time trying to embrace and evangelize those who are lost. Uh, and a lot of our focus really needs to be the next generation, right? And it's hard because you, I'm now going to be 60 next year. So, I mean, am I going to, is, is my target audience six year olds? Not really. Um, it's still teenagers, it's still actually junior hires, because it turns out that the, the, the rate of skepticism, the age of skepticism, is much younger than it has ever been before, where it used to be, it'd be final card on 17, like an 85 15 principle. 85% of Christians became Christians by the age of 17, only 15% became Christians after that age. That figure's been around for years. Uh, right now, that figure has dropped. There's good reason to believe it's dropped to as young as 12. So that 85-15 principle means that if you aren't in, and what it really means is that the minute you give kids a smartphone or their friends have a smartphone, if they aren't equipped to, to be able to make the case for why this is true, you're going to be playing catch-up the rest of the way. So I do think if it's me, I'm going to spend time focused on younger people. So when I write something, I try to make it incredibly visual. This next book has got 400 illustrations in it. And the reason why we're doing this, kind of creating a graphic novel, is, is that because we have a generation that is, I mean, look, we can either say this is not right, that there are not as many readers in this generation, or that maybe, you know, you know but, or, or we can just say, look, how do I reach that generation? What is the language they are speaking? It's a visual language. So I'm always trying to figure out ways to reach the next generation, because I do think that is going to be if you care about the future of Christianity in America, well, then the future is right in front of us. They're, they're the kids in public school right now. They're the kids in grade school. That's the future of Christianity in this in this country. Oh, that's so exactly right. that, Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to actually do what I have to do to reach that generation. And a lot of this is I never talk down to that generation. I talk to them as though they're 60 years old. But I understand that they're a visual generation. I need to use illustrations that are quick. They've seen them on TV, cop stories. I do all that because... I'm trying to reach another generation. Well, we definitely need to have you back to talk more about that. But in our last couple of minutes together, talk a little bit about some of the resources you do have, whether it's for adults or even some of your curriculum that you have for Cold Case Christianity for kids, for example. Yeah, I mean, all of our adult stuff is located at coldcasechristianity.com, and we just try to make all that stuff, crank it out to be available. We have teaching resources for all of our books. So, yeah, we, I sell books. I mean, I've got books there. But, I mean, honestly, you can get a ton of stuff before you ever need to buy a book. 
probably from that website for sure. And if you do, then we've got free teaching resources once you do buy the book, PowerPoint, videos, teacher guides, all that stuff. But what we're really, my wife and I are probably the most proud of is our work at casemakersacademy.com. And that's our academy for young people, age 13. And it offers three kind of academy courses that are certain, you, know, you get a certificate at the end, they're self-guided. Um, and they're basically in the evidence for the resurrection, the evidence for God's existence, and then how to share that uh, with the world around you in three steps. Those are the three academies. And so a lot of our homeschool uh, you know, families who read our stuff, they, they are using this because let's face it, homeschoolers like me and my wife, when we were homeschooling, you're always looking for free free material you can yes. use to do your Bible studies. And this is, this, this is all free once you have the you know, free and expensive kids book started. So that's really where we think that's the most important work we're doing is probably coming out of that work at uh, CaseMakersAcademy.com. ColdCaseChristianity.com will give you information about these and all of his other resources. We want to thank you for being with us today and look forward to having you again with us in the future. And those of you listening today, we want to thank you for being with us today as well. We want to encourage you to check out more episodes at IamAWatchman.com and join us next time on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the donate button. Thanks for listening and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.